Good morning, Mary. News Media TV family. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning, and I'm wishing for everyone a wonderful and a productive day. And in the news this morning for December 13, 2023, 26-year-old man charged with murder in Dunkirk. A construction worker has been charged with murder while his suspected accomplice is being sought by the police following the shooting death of a man in McIntyre Villa, otherwise called Dunkirk, Kingston 16 in January. Charged is 26-year-old Osagi Marshall, otherwise called Billy, of McIntyre Villa. Dead is the 32-year-old Nico Barrett, also of the community. Along with the murder of Barrett, Marshall was also charged with the possession of a prohibited weapon and the possession of ammunition. Allegations are that about 6 p.m., Barrett was standing along a pathway in the community when he was pounced upon by Marshall and another man who was traveling on foot and opened fire hitting him multiple times. The police were alerted and Barrett was taken to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. An investigation was launched and Marshall was arrested. He was charged on Monday, December 11, after he was questioned in the presence of his attorney. Biker dies after crashing into utility pole in Manchester. A motorcyclist died as a result of injuries he sustained after crashing into a concrete utility pole in Craighead, northern Manchester, on Tuesday morning. Police named the deceased as Duin Uter, 33, a resident of Bigwood District in the parish. A police report said about 3 a.m., Uter lost control of his motorcycle and slammed into the utility pole. He was taken to hospital, where he was pronounced dead. Since the start of December, two motorcyclists have died in crashes in Manchester. On December 1, Shamario Thomas, 21, died as a result of injuries he sustained in a collision on Caledonia Road in Mandeville. No ID parade done for Beach Stout co-accused. A detective corporal who on Tuesday said he played a supporting role in the investigation of the July 20, 2020 murder of Tonya MacDonald in Portland testified in the Home Circuit Court in Kingston that Oscar Barnes, the man accused of stabbing the 32-year-old woman to death, was never placed on an identification parade. Barnes is currently on bail. Tonya, who was the second wife of a Portland businessman Everton Beach Stout MacDonald, was stabbed multiple times and her throat slashed on the Tallington Main Road in Sherwood Forest, Portland. The Toyota Axio motor car she was driving was set on fire and her partially burned body was found beside the vehicle. Beach Stout, who is on trial for her murder, along with Barnes, allegedly hired a man by the name of Denville in Bobla Minot to kill her. Minot allegedly subcontracted the hit to Barnes. Minot, who was taken in for questioning in relation to a warrant under the Firearms Act, confessed to his involvement in Tonya's killing and was eventually sentenced to 19 years and 10 months in prison. He not only implicated himself, but went a step further to implicate Beachy Stout and Barnes and agreed to turn Crown witness. Facing questions from Ernest Davis, one of two attorneys representing Barnes, the detective corporal denied that there was no concrete evidence which caused the Barnes to now be on trial. Vincent Wellesley is the second attorney representing Barnes. On August 5, 2020, with Mr. Minot in the vehicle, we were heading to Portland, but something happened when we got to Anoto Bay, St. Mary. Mr. Minot showed me an area and told me something about a person. He pointed out the person to us. Before he pointed out the person, he never gave us a description of him. We didn't conduct an identification parade because it was spontaneous, the policeman told the seven-member jury on Tuesday. The detective corporal continued to give an account of the events, which he said unfolded on the day of Barnes's arrest, claiming that they were led by what a man not had told him and his team. When the vehicle stopped, we approached this man. I had no previous description of the person. When we arrested the person, that was when we ascertained his name. I am not sure of the total number of statements Minot gave, but I don't recall if he mentioned Oscar Barnes in his statements. Mr. Minot told me that he did not know his name, but I was there when he was pointed out. I do not agree with you that the identity of Oscar Barnes is questionable. In his statement, Minot mentioned the man he contracted and his location and so forth. I took no details about the face of the man. I don't have a written account of that, the policeman said. 
He told the court that he was aware that Barnes's house was searched, but could not speak to whether any items of clothing were taken from him to form part of the investigations. I cannot say specifically if DNA or anything at all connects Mr. Barnes to the murder. I wasn't there, but I am aware that a car was seized as part of our process. There was a search and nothing offensive was found, he said. A request was made by presiding judge Chester Stamp by Barnes's attorney Ernest Davis to issue an order so that the same motor vehicle that was seized could be released from the custody of the police as it is of no further interest to them in relation to the case. Justice Stamp told Davis to put his request in writing and address it to the relevant parties. The eighth witness in the trial, a detective sergeant, also took the stand on Tuesday. The detective sergeant was the lead investigator in the Tonya MacDonald murder. The policeman, who has been a member of the Jamaica Constabulary Force for 28 years and a member of the Major Investigations Division for 11 years, told the court that the matter was the second high-profile case he had investigated over the span of his investigative career. This is considered a serious high-profile case based on the status surrounding the victim and the husband of the victim. I was not the only investigator. There were several others who assisted. I received the information of a witness who could assist with the investigations, and I interviewed and recorded a statement during which useful information was gathered in relation to a name that was given. I provided the name to members of my intelligence unit at MID, but even at that point, I did not have a suspect. I recorded several statements up to that point. I physically took them, the lead investigator told the court, before explaining that 11 days after the murder, he went to visit B.G. Stout at one of his business establishments in Portland to empathize with him. On July 31, 2020, I, along with my team, went to the Maryshine Enterprise located at 8 William Street in Port Antonio, Portland. This enterprise is owned by B.G. Stout and Tony MacDonald. I met with Everton MacDonald. We were invited to his office upstairs. I introduced myself to him and introduced the other members of my team. I spent a very long time because I empathized with him, knowing he lost his wife. I told him of our approach towards the investigation, and I asked him several questions in relation to himself, his wife, their associates, and their family members. Mr. MacDonald was very cooperative. He also made us comfortable by providing us with the chairs. He was seated around the desk, and we faced each other. I told him I was requesting a written statement from him in regards to what he had told me. He agreed, and I recorded the statement. Integrity Commission submits four investigation reports and rulings to Parliament. The Integrity Commission on Tuesday said it has submitted four investigation reports and associated indicative rulings by the Director of Corruption Prosecution for tabling in Parliament. The Commission says it anticipates that the reports submitted pursuant to and in conformance with Section 54 of the Integrity Commission Act together with the associated indicative rulings will be tabled in both Houses of Parliament as soon as possible. Last month, House Speaker Juliet Holness announced that she would end the practice of reports from the Commission being tabled upon submission. Instead, she ruled that the reports would first be sent to the Commission's Oversight Committee for deliberations and later tabled with the committee's own report. The ruling has been criticized by the parliamentary opposition and the civil society groups. NEPA investigating oil spill in Rio Cobre The National Environment and the Planning Agency says it is investigating an oil spill in the Rio Cobre in Bogwalk, St. Catherine. NEPA says it was notified of the incident about 5 p.m. Monday and they dispatched a team to conduct investigations. It says that based on its investigation, the spill emanated from a factory in the area. NEPA has since met with the company's management team, who is cooperating with the agency, to undertake the necessary cleanup exercise. NEPA also reached out to Petrojam for assistance in this regard, and they have agreed to provide the necessary resources to extract the oil and to prevent its movement further downstream, said Angel Hamilton, manager of public education and corporate communication at NEPA. She said the oil in the Rio Cobre is in the vicinity of the flat bridge. NEPA has come in for criticism over its management of the environment, 
with the Jamaica Environment Trust on Monday, calling for Jamaicans to demand more answers from the regulatory agency regarding a recent fish kill in the Kingston Harbor. NEPA on Monday said it was reviewing the circumstances surrounding the fish kill and would not be able to comment further.